back. Can you hear me okay in the back? All right, cool. Uh, so I'm Rotem, this is Thomas, and today we're going to be talking about um, the, a, an observational study that we did using uh, an online community sample where we asked people about uh, their microdosing habits, if those exist. Uh, so the structure of this talk is going to be a more standard kind of uh, us introducing what we did, why we did it, uh, and uh, our findings. Uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about uh, how we think it is important uh, to do science. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, we're going to talk about some of the future implications. <laughs> definition. Uh, in essence, there's no, there are no studies published on it, and no one is really, there's no consensus on exactly what we mean when we say microdosing. We know it to be a small amount of a substance, but we don't exactly know how much. Um, in terms of psychedelics, when we speak about microdosing, I think this has already kind of come up uh, in the previous talks, and I'm sure it will come up in the, in the other talks today. Uh, we mean to say a dose that has some kind of effect, but does not induce a full uh, psychedelic effect. So you don't trip, you basically, this is something that you can take and still go to work. You can go about your um, usual routine. Um, the operational definitions that we came up with are just for the substances that we're interested in. So in our study, we were mostly interested in LSD and psilocybin. So for LSD, the cutoff that we use, at least for now, is less than 25 <coughs> micrograms. And for uh, mushrooms containing psilocybin, we used uh, less than 0.25 grams. Now, the reason we kind of went through this, these levels is that there's a lot of variability for how sensitive people are, and we had a lot of variability in our reports. So for now, this is a cutoff. We have the data for exactly what uh, people were using, but we haven't analyzed it yet. We'll hopefully report it uh, soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, microdosing has been, even though there's no real operational definition, it has already been picking up quite a bit as a practice. And it's in the news, it's everywhere. I'm sure everyone has seen a bunch of news pieces about it. This is just one about people taking LSD with breakfast, normally microdosing. Um, and yeah, it's very popular. As a matter of fact, even though there's no real published research about microdosing, there are already people capitalizing on this practice. So there's already the first online microdosing coach. Uh, I don't know what kind of evidence they're based on, probably just a lot of the uh, anecdotal stuff that everyone has, but we're aiming to get a more uh, precise scientific idea of what microdosing is and what it does, and how to use it in the best way possible. Um, some people have already done work on full dose psychedelics. As a matter of fact, New Scientist, which is an international science magazine, dedicated their uh, November 22nd issue just to the renaissance of psychedelic research, which is very, very cool uh, that it's becoming more, ma more mainstream, but because it's just full dose psychedelics that have been uh, studied so far and published, uh, this is what they introduced in this, um, this magazine. And so there are uh, a lot of these studies that have shown that full dose psychedelics are very useful. This is one excellent example uh, done by Carter Harris et al, where they measured, they, uh, they took a sample of people who were depressed. So the, the way they measured depression is using, using the kids uh, scale and 
at baseline, you can see people were depressed. They were above the threshold for what is considered clinically depressed. Just one week after a full dose of <coughs> magic mushrooms, um, people were below the threshold for depression, and that was maintained over three months. That is very encouraging. Those are amazing results. I think that's super impressive, and it gives us a lot of hope for the kind of research and the kind of uh, uses that we can have for at least for full dose psychedelics. What about microdosing, though? I mean, full dose psychedelics is not always easy. Some people describe this, the experience of taking a full dose of a psychedelic as uncomfortable, uh, sometimes difficult, and it takes up a lot of time and energy. What if we could reach at least some of the positive results that we get from full dose psychedelics using microdosing? Um, that'd be pretty great, right? If you could improve some, some of the things, like some of what Dan was talking about before, like creativity, uh, maybe get more motivation for the things that you want to do. Um, maybe enhance your therapy sessions, kind of like what Tal mentioned earlier today. There's a lot of potential. Um, and for now, there are also a lot of anecdotes, but not no real research to, to back them up. So, yeah. Do we know what happens after the three months? I think they, that's when they stopped uh, looking into it. But I can like I can give you the citation later, and you can look into it. Um, so, anecdotes. There are so many. Everyone has them. You've heard a bunch before we thought about asking people in our survey to kind of to say if they had any experiences that they want to report outside of the specific questions that we asked. Um, and they did. They did. They had a lot to say. Um, <laughs> but we only have so much time today. So I'm only going to give you a few that we thought uh, were really powerful and give major impetus for uh, doing research about this. So first, one person said that when they microdose, they understand things faster. That's pretty cool. Another person said that it helped with uh, the, their depression, alcoholism. That's great. Another person said depression is nearly gone. Their anxiety is now manageable. They quit cigarettes. That's cool. And another person said it helped with their migraines, which is, I've never heard about that until we saw it here. This is all very cool. This is very exciting, but this is not science. This is people saying what they have experienced firsthand. And we want to know if this is for real or if this maybe is just people's placebo effect. Maybe there are other variables that we're not aware of that somehow interact with their, these behaviors. And so we want to do this scientifically. We want to do it well, and we want to uh, document everything. And that's very important to us. And now Thomas is going to tell you about how we think that should be done. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, awesome. Uh, so yeah, we want to be good scientists about this kind of thing. Um, we don't just want to take anecdotes at their word. And ideally, what we want to do is we want to generate our hypotheses and then design good studies, uh, collect our data, analyze that data, and then report our results honestly and openly. Uh, and then we can use our honest and open results to generate new hypotheses and move forward with science. Uh, unfortunately, that's not exactly what's been done in the past with a lot of uh, research. So uh, what we see is people failing to control for bias. And this isn't just in microdosing uh, research, because there basically is uh, very little or none. And um, uh, so one example is that uh, across all of psychology, about 40% of the results replicated. Uh, so that is when you run an experiment that is essentially the same as the original experiment, um, a lot of it doesn't replicate. In fact, more than half of it uh, doesn't show up. So you could think of those effects as not necessarily being real effects, even though they're published in the literature. So what ends up happening is people don't control for their biases. They run very few participants and then find things uh, among that could be there due to chance, uh, run all sorts of uh, statistics and basically they have a guess 
and then they test their guess, and then that doesn't work out, so they test another guess, and that's really not the way to do statistics. And in the end, uh, whenever they end up finding something uh, that isn't necessarily real, because it could be there due to statistical chance, they do this thing called parking, which is hypothesizing after the results are known. So they write up their introduction as if they were looking for the thing that they eventually found. Uh, but that's not the way to do science. So we don't want to do that. We want to be good scientists about it. And one of the strongest ways of doing that is by pre-registering your study. Uh, basically, pre-registration is where you write, you, you have your guess, your hypothesis, and you write it down, and you tell it to other people, and then you do, uh, you, you write down what you're going to do, and then you do what you said you're going to do. <laughs> and then you tell everyone the results of doing that openly and honestly, because then we can use those results openly and honestly in the future to build new hypotheses and uh, move forward. So our study is pre-registered on the Open Science Framework, and there's actually this link right here, and you can go to that link and you'll see our entire study protocol. Uh, some of our materials right now are up there, like the survey that we asked people is already up there, and our uh, uh, all of our hypotheses are pre-registered, and our data will eventually also be available for everyone. So you can actually rerun our statistics and make sure we did it correctly, or you can also explore uh, freely our data set and see if you find something that looks interesting, and then generate new hypotheses of your own and run uh, future studies. So I believe now Rotem will tell you about, no, you got one more, I got one more. <laughs> In our study we collected, uh, so basically our study was an online survey and we put it to uh, Reddit and uh, Facebook and Twitter social media links. So Reddit is a social media news website aggregator site and it's got these things called subreddits that are sort of smaller communities that curate content and uh, serve particular interests. So we posted our survey to a variety of subreddits, including r slash microdosing, which has like 15,000 people subscribed to that subreddit, uh, r slash LSD, r slash drugs, drug nerds, uh, nootropics, and sort of a bunch of other subreddits, and then uh, also shared our links on Facebook and Twitter. Now it's time for road time. Again, these hypotheses are pre-registered, so you can see all of them online. We had an idea of what to expect, or we thought we did, and it's based mostly on these anecdotes that, like I said, everyone has heard, and some of it is from full-dose uh, research. So first, we expected people who microdose to be lower on uh, negative emotionality. People who are high on negative emotionality are generally um, prone to bad moods, they have poor self-concept. Uh, people who are low on it are generally they're a little more confident, more enthusiastic. Um, and so basically if you're low on this, you are more likely to be mentally healthy. And so we thought people who microdose will be lower on this based on these anecdotes. We also hypothesized that people who microdose will be lower on dysfunctional attitudes. There's a specific scale that measures just dysfunctional attitudes. Basically, the higher you are on this scale, the more likely you are to be depressed and or anxious. Uh, one sample item from the scale is uh, even a, something like, even a partial failure is as bad as a whole failure. Uh, so generally, people who think these kinds of things are likely to be depressed and or anxious. Uh, next, we hypothesize that people who microdose will be higher on wisdom. Wisdom is a pretty tricky thing to conceptualize and operationalize <coughs> because we kind of only know if something was uh, wise or not after the fact, right? When we know the results, it's hard to say ahead of time. 
but the scale that we used um, put together a few facets that I think are broadly accepted as uh, things that are relevant for wisdom, such as <coughs> feeling of unity with nature, or being in tune with one's own, one's own emotions, or being into philosophy. Things that are generally related to wisdom. And finally, open-mindedness. Um, this is a personality trait, which is uh, related to, I guess, you would think that it's self-explanatory, but it's not quite. So people who are low on this are uh, more traditional, they're more conventional, they have their whatever uh, range of interests, and they're not looking to broaden it particularly. People who are high on this are looking for new things. They have, um, I guess a good way of describing it is, it is speaking to the three subscales. One is intellectual curiosity, another is uh, creative intellect, and the third is aesthetic sensibility. So this is what uh, this scale purports to measure. Now this specific hypothesis was based on a study from 2011 where they showed that people, after just one full dose of uh, psilocybin, have a, a significantly incre increased uh, openness. So we thought, hey, maybe this happens with microdosing as well. What did we find? <laughs> we found some pretty cool stuff. Um, so I'm going to start with talking more about the demographics, what we like, who does what and how. And after that, Alex is going to tell you more about the specific hypotheses that we have. So first, um, are these people microdosing or not? So most of our sample are people that are either microdosing presently or have microdosed in the past. Um, the 34% you see, so it's 30% people who are into it but have not done it yet. The reason we chose to ask this way and not just ask, are you microdosing or have you microdosed ever, is because we're trying to create a quasi-control group. Or, in other words, if you look at it, it's almost like a timeline where we have people who are into it but have not done it. We have people who are currently doing it and we have people who have done it in the past and are no longer doing it. So we could test a bunch of hypotheses using these as a quasi. Again, this is not a proper control group, but it can teach us something about which we can create a hypothesis that we then test in a lab. Next, what are people taking? Overwhelmingly, people are microdosing on LSD. Um, next favorite, next best favorite is magic mushrooms. And you can notice that out of the 50% other, other lysergamides, which basically are related to LSD, and psilocetin, which is related to psilocybin, which is the active substance in magic mushrooms, those are the most popular substances. Um, this is interesting and this is useful. Now we have an idea of what people are actually using. Granted, this is not a perfectly unbiased sample, but this is still an interesting finding. How often are people doing it? Well, you see that there are two big bumps here. One is people who microdose one day on, two days off. We suspect that this is related to uh, other people's research. You'll hear a lot about it later on, super interesting stuff. Uh, but this is a protocol that exists for microdosing. So we suspect that uh, that's probably why. Notice though that a lot of people are also doing it every other day and one day on, three days off. So it's a little flexible. The next bump is people who microdose about once a week. We suspect that there, these are uh, two distinct microdosing habits or behaviors where some people are taking it almost medicinally, they take it regularly, and they know what to expect. Some people are taking it maybe recreationally, but for sure occasionally. Um, so these are distinct. Our sample is quite biased. Right? Too bad Tao will be left, but uh, yeah. The thing about uh, white male, yeah, these, so this is our sample. This doesn't necessarily mean that these are the people who microdose on planet Earth. It means that these are the people who responded to our survey. Um, perhaps, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is our sample. And now for our pre registered hypotheses and the results. <laughs> so I'll 
sound is good? Yeah? All right, I'll, I'll uh, bring it through our pre-registered hypotheses. So on this chart here, uh, we're showing negative emotionality first. And I'll just describe the chart layout because all the charts will be the same. Uh, across the bottom here, we have microdosing status, uh, whether you are a microdoser, and that includes current and former microdoser, uh, or non-microdoser, and that's people who have not microdosed yet, whether they're interested or not. Uh, so that's the cyan and the orange box. Then on the y-axis here, we have negative emotionality from 0 to 100. And uh, this hypothesis was the, uh, that negative emotionality would be lower in microdosers. And that is what we found, uh, that statistically speaking, uh, microdosers scored lower on negative emotionality. On negative emotionality, it's also the case that uh, women or females tend to score uh, higher on um, negative emotionality. And this effect uh, remains even when we control for that. So we did find, generally, that uh, women did score higher. But above and beyond that effect, uh, microdosers scored lower, whether they were male or female, uh, with the limitation of our sample being biased as it is. Uh, then looking at dysfunctional attitudes, we also found that uh, statistically speaking, microdosers scored lower on dysfunctional attitudes. So as a reminder, this is the kind of thinking where a person believes that if they have a partial failure, that's essentially the same as, an, as a complete failure, which uh, you believe that. That's, that's not true, actually. <laughs> it's, it's a different thing. Uh, and, and uh, we also controlled here for a previous diagnosis of a, a clinical psychological disorder. So above and beyond, uh, so we did find that people who had a previous diagnosis of a clinical disorder, whether it was anxiety, uh, depression, or any other of uh, a variety of disorders, they did tend to score higher on dysfunctional attitudes. But above and beyond that effect, microdosers still scored lower. So if you were a microdoser with a history of um, clinical disorder, then you still scored lower than uh, the non-microdosers. In terms of wisdom, we found that microdosers had higher wisdom scores, which is in line with our hypotheses uh, that are pre-registered hypotheses. And then finally, when it comes to open-mindedness, we did not find that microdosers were more open-minded than their non-microdosing counterparts. So. Uh, you can see that uh, our hypotheses, particularly about negative emotionality and about dysfunctional attitudes, were vindicated. Uh, and we had lower scores for microdosers. And then for wisdom, we had this higher score. Uh, and then for openness, we had no effect. Uh, one of the possible reasons that we're thinking about that is that our sample as a whole might be more open than the general population because they're on Reddit, and they're willing to fill out a survey about microdosing, so they might actually be uh, more open. But there's no way exactly to tease that apart with the kind of study design that we have. So this is just more emphasis that we should bring microdosing into the lab and actually test it under controlled circumstances. Uh, so this all sounds pretty great. Uh, things we've heard today sounds like microdosing is pretty great. Um, but there are some drawbacks, for sure. Uh, we asked participants to fill out up to three benefits and three drawbacks of microdosing <coughs> and rate the importance of those benefits and drawbacks. So uh, the top drawback so far, uh, this is definitely preliminary data because we're not even done coding it yet, but this is what it looks like right now. Uh, the top drawback fact uh, so far is illegality, so that it can put you in legal jeopardy because of unnecessary draconian drug laws, which we all know to be generally the case. Uh, it's not going to get caught with illegal criminalized substances. Um, Dose accuracy also, so accidentally taking too much whenever you've got stuff to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is your planning to go to work, and then surprise, everything's way more interesting. Than <laughs> uh, uh, we also found that anxiety, so increased anxiety, was a uh, was a pretty potent drawback, so it forces anxiety on the part on the uh, participant. And also um, that it can be distracting if it is acid. So, uh, people did describe poor focus in some circumstances. Uh, a lot of these parallel the benefits, um, but so 
one thing to remember, you know, looking at the top two of these, it is criminalized substances, so we really don't recommend doing illegal things. I think that's a higher order offense if you recommend that to people. Uh, and also, in terms of dose accuracy, this is usually black market illicit substances. You don't really know necessarily what you're getting. So one thing to remember is that if you're gonna do this, which we don't recommend, then you should test your substance, which I, I forgot to bring our reagent. Uh, but it's super, super simple to test your substance. So don't be intimidated by like, ah, I have to do chemistry. It's like a bottle, it's like food coloring kind of thing, and you just drop it on, it's super easy. So definitely test your substances, uh, not that you should have any substances in the first place. That's very <laughs> um, so yeah, there are definitely drawbacks to microdosing, but uh, you know, there's some benefits too. So uh, our, our benefits we saw improved mood, we saw improved creativity, uh, again, improved focus and improved energy. So people are definitely reporting that there are benefits. And generally speaking, they report that the importance of the benefits is higher on average than the importance of the drawbacks. Uh, but it is important to remember that there are drawbacks and uh, that's your substance. So this all sounds pretty cool. Uh, and one of the things we, we have, so we presented here today uh, preliminary data and our data set is not fully analyzed, so we have lots more to say, so again, stay tuned. Uh, one of those things is creativity, and um, we have a creativity measure that's being analyzed right now, and so we're very interested in that, and we're interested in the future of bringing people onto the lab and testing uh, sort of measured creativity, and maybe even how creativity, uh, how microdosing can interact with creativity, and creativity's general tendency to decline with age. Um, we're also uh, really interested in using these benefits and drawbacks to suggest scales to the community of researchers to focus their measurements so that we're measuring what people are saying that they're experiencing. So when someone says, I feel more anxiety, we should probably be measuring anxiety, or I feel more distracted, we should be using a measure <coughs> uh, of distraction, whether that's a behavioral measure or uh, sort of a self-report scale. All of this is is intended to be the foundation, a sort of solid scientific foundation for this kind of work going forward. And there's you know, multiple careers to be made in this kind of a field. Uh, and we hope that others will build off of the work that we've done here. Uh, we also hope to bring microdosers into the lab. Um, microdosing, as Rotem said earlier, is uh, pot potentially amenable to circumstances where uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to do such a thing with a full dose, so because a full dose can be so intense and make you very sensitive and fragile even. Uh, but microdosing is a lot less intense generally, so maybe we could run more of the sort of classic psychological studies, the, uh, you know, I'm sure the Stroop task and all sorts of things to figure out more about the attentional mechanisms and the, and the detail at lower levels of what's going on. And then we can also throw people into an fMRI and EEG and all that stuff, if someone would like to give us money. Uh, and uh, yeah, microdosing also has this unknown quantity of potential for psychotherapeutic environments where, um, because it's sort of a lower stakes environment, uh, given the microdoses, it might be interesting to see how those things can play together. But again, it's all sort of an unknown, uh, like a frontier situation. Uh, we're also interested in the idea of the potential for bringing microdosers into the lab and having them in a driving simulator because as much as we're all totally waiting for self-driving cars, right, we're not there yet, uh, and we don't want anyone driving on psychedelic substances, that seems like a bad idea. So what we would like to do is bring people into the lab uh, and put them in a driving simulator. Driving can be conceived of as really one of the most complex uh, multi-sensory integration problems that a human being has to deal with. You have to deal with uh, integrating like mobile and stationary visual information as well as auditory information. Uh, you have to coordinate tactile information with your arms and fingers and hands on the steering wheel and then your legs and feet on the pedals. And you have to do all of this at breakneck pace, all with the risk of great personal and interpersonal harm. So don't microdose and drive, because uh, that's 
just not a good idea. We don't want anyone to get hurt. And also, we don't want the media blowing something out of proportion and being like, ah, these people are crashing on acid, so uh, stop researching. We don't want that kind of thing because we would like to research it. Uh, and I'm sure the uh, clinicians among us uh, really care about helping people and would like to be able to do that. So uh, thanks so much. You can see our link up there again to the study. Uh, is uh, if you didn't get a chance to look at it before, but we've got tons of time for questions, I believe. Oh, yeah. started, uh, but fewer made it all the way to the end. Do you that number? Yeah, I looked it up today. Uh, so 425 people made it like basically all the way through the survey. Uh -huh. And then of that sample, 313 are uh, microdosers or former microdosers. Okay. And so just the incidence of anxiety? Uh, we don't have that yet. Uh, so we're in the process of analyzing all of those data. Yeah. Um, I understand that microdosing can have lasting benefits. So I noticed you incorporated, uh, was it 69% of the people that formerly microdosed? Do you think that might affect your study? It was 34 or yeah. something percent of people had, yeah. yeah. So the kind of analysis that we're looking to do uh, is see if the benefits are really, so if they exist for people who have microdosed in the past but are no longer microdosing, right? So try and create, like I said, this uh, semi-timeline. So we are interested in seeing whether or not that, that is a thing, for sure. But we haven't analyzed that yet. Were you able to get any information from those who were microdosing about how they were before, so that before they microdosed, so that the two groups would be potentially the same on their scales? No, we, we definitely designed the study with that idea, uh, consciously not doing that, uh, because we wanted to get a cross-sectional, we wanted to have like a one time point thing. Uh, so, because we, we wanted, you know, asking people on the internet to keep coming back uh, is a challenge that I'm sure Sophia has faced. Uh, but, yeah, but yeah so, so we wanted to do that cross-sectional. I mean, maybe the people who tend to microdose are people who have a the whole population, many different so, so for that, we do have that kind of quasi timeline approach where we can't see what a person was doing before, but we can look at people who are interested in microdosing but haven't done it yet. Right. Um, we also did ask people specifically whether they saw any uh, increases in certain health behaviors or reductions in certain uh, sort of unhealthy behaviors. So whether they were using less alcohol or uh, smoking and that kind of thing, or whether they had increased health behaviors like meditating. meditating. Yeah. I have just one other point. If you have the data, so I don't want to do lots of this, if there are different in terms of age, Yeah, we looked yeah. into that. I think our youngest participant is 17, oldest is 73. Was it? Yeah, it's it's yeah, we have a big spread. Mostly, I think most of our sample was on the younger side, uh, up to <coughs> early 30s. Between groups, do you remember? I don't remember. I don't remember it being <coughs> a significant effect of age. Yeah. Were other medications or drugs a significant factor in any of the we have not looked, we did ask if people were using other drugs, uh, both legal and illegal, uh, but we have not analyzed that yet. I know this might be premature because you're still crunching through the data, but uh, I noticed that there was a significant sub-slice about the people doing LSD and psilocybin and that kind of perspective, or DMT. Yeah. Have you looked at, like, is the microdosing of DMT showing comparable effects, or I know you're speaking on this without 
Uh, I would say, so we posted, one of the subreddits that we posted to was RDMT, which we got a surprising amount of people really interested, like, I'm so happy that you're doing research on this. But briefly glancing through the DMT data, it looks like a lot of the DMT people may not have been microdosing DMT. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are some, but there's a lot that are. Like, like, I don't think 30 milligrams of DMT is a microdose. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we're gonna have to cull that group. We don't have enough power for DMT. And it also made it tricky to kind of define the cutoff same way as we did with uh, Magic Mushrooms and LSD <coughs> because like Anna said, a lot of people reported macro dosing. Yep. Um, do you have any information about the duration of the micro dosing? Um, I think that's really important, whether it's uh, 10 weeks or whatever, because of the fact that adaptive homeostasis comes into play. <coughs> biologically and genetically change after a period of time in response to what's happening. And the secondary question would be, why the heck would you even consider dimethyltryptamine as being equivalent to these other drugs? Because dimethyltryptamine being natural to us is not dose-dependent in its effect. Uh, OK, well, to, to get to the first point, uh, Yes, we have, uh, we have total lifetime microdoses. I don't know that we have, uh, because of the variable spacing, we don't have exactly how long a period, uh, whether it's in weeks or months. Um, but I guess we could do some math to do like, how many did you do, how often did you space it to sort of calculate that. Um, I'm not sure about the, uh, so, so we're not talking about DMT as equivalent necessarily to LSD or psilocybin. Um, but I, I don't know that it's not dose dependent. It, it seems pretty, uh, there's different like levels of tripping in DMT. But that's a whole other issue, right? But that's a whole other, yeah. Uh, I know you guys are still going into data, but can you talk to me a little more about how you would scale or test uh, creativity uh, or increase creativity? For sure. Um, so creativity is a bit of a wonky construct. It's hard to really define. There are a lot of different kinds. Of, you know, there's convergent and divergent thinking. There are a lot of ways to measure it. Um, the way we were kind of, we had a little bit of trouble coming up with a measure for the study uh, because these are all volunteers that are giving their time and we don't want to waste it. So we tried to come up with the simplest, easiest test. The one we used is the unusual uses task where people are given a household object and they're asked to give as many unusual uses for that object in a defined period of time. Uh, when we do a lab study, we're more interested in other kinds of uh, creative thinking. As a matter of fact, I, I only have so much faith in the results that we will get from the measurement that we have. Uh, I think it would be more correct, and I think this also follows uh, the theoretical framework that Dan presented before, to look into uh, divergent thinking, essentially coming up with novel, uh, interesting solutions for problems. Does that answer the question? Oh yeah, totally. So like in, in the future for maybe new studies, that's how you would examine for, for more clinical uh, test exam. Yeah. Um, in terms of the quantum differences you had between the microdosers and the non-microdosers, any surprises from your point of view? I am surprised that, I forget what the number is, but we had 4% 4, 4 of our sample are people that are not, have never microdosed and are not interested in it, and <laughs> still found it in their hearts to participate. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, not my surprise. that's not really what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, in, on the graph, looking at the graph, the difference to my eye, it didn't seem that great. Mm -hmm. But from your point of view, was the difference in the range that you were imagining when you created your hypothesis? Certainly. We didn't uh, mention in our hypotheses what, what exact amount we were expecting or what magnitude of difference. Um, but I think more than, like, these differences are, well, they're statistically significant, but they're also, the magnitude is reasonable. More than this would be 
surprising and suspicious, I think. It wouldn't make sense, like something would be off, maybe people have too much of a bias in the way they're responding to our questions, things like that. So to me, this made sense. It's, it's also, um, sometimes when you see differences that appear large on scale, sometimes those scales are like, mark, mark this on a zero to seven scale. And so you'll see a difference in amount that's actually less than the size that you could mark something different on the scale. Uh, whereas our scales are all zero to 100, and they're like validated uh, questionnaires. Um, and so the differences that you see are uh, like large enough that people could actually say different things. I don't know if that's a, like, I don't know if that's a clear point or just like a psychometric nitpick, but. Do you see any difference in, in those markers that's an interesting analysis. We didn't register, pre-register that, uh, but that would be interesting to look at and formulate hypotheses for the future, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we, we pre-registered an idea that uh, we expected that microdosing benefits would sort of, uh, we expected like a complex relationship so that it would decline the more frequently you do it. Uh, and that there would be sort of like the Fadiman spot uh, protocol would be like a peak of uh, benefits, but we didn't find that result. Um, but they're like complex analyses. Um, the data that you're uh, registering online, are you putting your raw data or are you only putting the data that you're uh, forming whatever? Uh, yeah, so. The awesome thing about open science is that we're going to put the raw data up there uh, as much as we can. So we can't immediately just dump it all up there because participants, we, we have these open text fields where participants can enter information. And even though we're repeatedly like, don't tell us who you are, <laughs> uh, some people will write like, ah, oh, I love talking about this. Here's my email. And so we have to go through all the text fields. and. Uh, de-identify anything like that that comes up, but all the numbers will be uh, all available so that everyone can rerun our stats and, and check and run for new things and that sort of thing. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, the microdoses are a pass microdose, but they're So that differs. We didn't uh, force anyone to answer any question, but generally, yeah, people did say. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.